Hello, everybody. I am very happy to be on here tonight. It is Sunday, March 12th, and we are doing chapter one of our Thrive Community Book Club for the month. You, Alana's book, you can drop it. And every single week is a really special chapter because in each chapter, there is so much wisdom. And I always find in every chapter, there's a few things that I'm not doing or things I forgot why I was doing it. And I think it's very powerful to remember um, a few key factors that I saw really come up in chapter one. That And then I would love to hear from you guys what you were reminded of from chapter one, what resonated with you, what you feel like, oh, I'm still not doing that. Or I still feel a lot of like, uh, I still feel a lot of anxiety about doing that. <laughs> I still don't do it. Um, the first thing is the, I can lose weight. I will lose weight. My body loves losing weight. And so do I. Something we hear in the group over and over again. Yeah. But like, ugh, I just don't believe it. I just, I, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe I can do it. And if I don't believe I can do it, then it's really hard to turn down the French fries when it's just another day. You know, there's, it's not special. It's just French fries. And French fries always feel special if we don't believe we can lose weight. And as somebody who struggled with weight since I was eight years old, I really, I 100% get the lack of belief. The one thing that I'll say for me, and I'd love to hear from the other people here, is that when I didn't believe necessarily that um, I would love losing weight because I never really lost weight sustainably for a long period of time. Like I'd lost weight, but I hadn't gotten to uh, under, I hadn't gotten, gotten into my BMI, right? So I'd lost weight, but I wasn't, hadn't had weight loss, let's say to that extent. Um, it was hard to believe. What I chose to believe first was that I wouldn't stop this time till I got there. I wouldn't stop working in my mindset. I wouldn't give up. I would just keep going. And if I could believe that, then as I saw more progress and as I like would get rid of clothes, like not like keep heavier clothes, but get rid of clothes, I could believe, okay, I'm not going back there. And the belief process built up over time. It wasn't like whew, mindset, like transformation for me. And I'd love to hear from maybe the other coaches from some of you who feel like you do believe like now I know anytime I want to lose weight, I can lose weight with the two B mindset. Like if I go up five pounds and I want it to come down or I am up in my maintenance, top of my maintenance range and I want to go to the bottom. Oh, I, I believe it. I know my body feels better. I don't question it. I don't question the difference. It's just a matter of getting myself to do it or not. Am I ready or not ready to follow through? So I'd love to hear from you guys just on that one point. Do you feel you fully love and believe that you can lose weight right now? Ayala, you have your hand raised? Yeah, sorry. I don't, I, okay. I get confused with all these like things on Zoom. Um, so I think for me, I, I don't know if I remember when it happened, but the difference in 2B was the shift of no longer being the next time I need to lose weight, the next, I'm on my next diet. It all of a sudden kind of just made its way into me. I don't know if at the start, when I was starting it, that it was successful because I believed. I think that happened from living it and realizing and seeing that it was different you know, um, and learning the education that we get from, from the videos of 2B and from Alana. And all of a sudden it like dawns on me that, wow, you know, I'm really never going to die it again. Like, you know, this, this is it. And that became the belief that this was actually something that was possible to live a life like this. When I used to think they were just only a school of people who were like that, who'd be able to live within 
like what you would categorize, I guess, as a health, you know, in a BMI or this, whatever. Then the other people that were always dieting. And I was one of the people that was either on a diet or off a diet. And um, that became the belief. And the next stage, which took, I don't know how much longer it took, but it ended up going hand in hand with really seeing myself as this person that no longer looking in the mirror and always seeing the heavier version of me, because I think it was more, that's where I'd go back to, like I said, like, cause then on my next diet. So it was always like the status quo or where I would then revert back to was always, that's how I always saw myself. And the minute I understood and really felt like this was now it, and it wasn't going to be another diet that enabled, I guess when people call like body dysmorphia or this, whatever, um, that's when that changed for me. And I actually saw the, my reflection and saw the weight loss as something permanent. And that enabled me to see myself as, as the physically, the, the, the me yeah. that, you know, with the weight loss. And so I really, really just owe that to, to be. Yoni, what about you? So I, I, there were two transitions. One was when I was first introduced to, I'm going to say beach body because that's what it was called then. Um, the transition from portion fix to the 2B mindset went from diet mentality to healthy mindset. And that was like the first transition of breaking a cycle of trying any new fad diet that came out because portion fix was still literally as it's called, portion, it was still so many counting, measuring, like it was, it was obsessive in a certain way where I just have never seen to be, even though people are like, oh, you're obsessed with to be mindset, but I, I think that in a healthy way, I, I'm not obsessive about measuring things for the first time in my life when I first um, was introduced to to be. But as I say, that wasn't when it fully clicked. And I, I say that I half asked it the first time and you know, you should always fully ask everything. When I came back to to be mindset and decided that I literally was going to give it my all. And I don't mean in the unhealthy way of all or nothing, but I really am going to put myself into this and not say, I'm going to give myself X amount of time to see if this one works. That was the biggest change. Atkins, Weight Watchers, all of them had these time frames in my head. I have a wedding coming up. I need to lose weight for this dress. I need it. Those are great for short-term motivation. But for me, it was literally saying, I'm just going to do this. And there wasn't this end goal. And I don't want to say goal, but there wasn't this end time so that it, it never entered that, my, that diet mentality of, I have to hit it by X. And so it was just kind of continuing to push forward. And there were even like the different stages, which I know is actually part of next week's chapter, but it had to do with like, okay, I could lose weight oh my gosh, I've now surpassed a number I've never surpassed before. And I'm working less hard than I have on any food manage. I'm going to call it food management plan that I have from the time that I was 14 years old. And I was having more results by being less obsessive. I think for me, that was that real aha moment of like, holy cow, we've been doing something for over a year and we're not stopping, that was like, that was the big turning point. Most other things, if I'm scratched doing it for a year, and I don't mean when you go on, go off, go on, go off, but any program I had done before that where I, I barely made it to a year, when I hit one year at, on 2B, there wasn't even the thought in my mind of I'm not going to go forward. And I think that's for me where the I can't lose weight it never even happened on this. They had, um, I had the, I'm not really fully immersed again. I need to re-immerse myself, but there was, ne there was never the point of, I can't lose weight. So I think that's where that transition really happened. Um, that ties in perfectly to the next thing that I was reminded of is sometimes when we go into the To Be Mindset exclusive group, you see people who've lost, and even in our group, people who just have gone and they've really lost a tremendous amount of weight in a, well, let's say a relatively short period of time, hitting eight, 10 pounds a month, monthly. And what I think is really powerful to remember is that with not Alana's journey, 
And as she shares here, if that, if, if someone would have held up that expectation for her, she wouldn't have been able to lose weight. And that's why she coined two pounds at a time. Because for her, she was gaining and losing 30 pounds every summer, putting on 45 until finally going into high school. She started with her to be mindset and actually finished a year, not gaining, but with a net loss. Just having a net loss at the end of the year was her first milestone. It took all four years of high school to her freshman year of college till she even got to her BMI. Can I, can I say something? Yeah. On that, because I think it's so important for people to also really understand that everyone has their own journey. And one of the aspects that I think we can learn from how Alana went through this journey before 2B became 2B when she was just trying to adjust from what she learned in the summer. She always talks about how in the very, very beginning, all she did was replace volume no, with, with, with vegetables, right? So if she sure had a ton of popcorn at night, she yeah. made broccoli with butter, you know, like, and it started like that. So when we, as the coaches, very often you hear us say, like, don't try to necessarily do a thousand things all at the same time. Try one. This was before she no, you know, no FFCs at night or no, you know, so many of the other different things. It's about what you add. Now that it's already been kind of like figured out for you, that you have all the, you know, all the tricks or all the knowledge given, you know, out there. But again, if it's not for you to take on so many things at one time, that you already start feeling the change doing one thing at a time. And I think that's a really good lesson to learn from Alana's, you know, from Alana's journey herself. And, and I think she, it's just a powerful way to start the book because she's going to go through these steps and she does say things in this chapter, like stop the BS, right? And the excuses, you're never going to be able to lose the weight if you're never willing to confront your binge eating. And I'm not using binge in terms of, let's say, overeating. We're not trying to talk about compulsive binge eating. She very clearly in chapter one talks about the difference between an eating disorder and disordered eating. But for every single person who still does not write down everything you eat after a bad eating day and then get on the scale the next day, oh, I've still avoided the scale on a day where I feel really, really, really bloated because of medication or because of something else. And I really try to discipline myself to get on anyway. 90% of the time I would sound successful. I'm 100% successful in writing down every overeating episode. And it actually brings me a lot of calm and I'm able to forgive and move on much faster. But that took a long time. It really did because it's one of the hardest parts of changing your mindset for me anyway as somebody who's type A, who can be a little bit of a perfectionist, who likes to be a go-getter, who likes to set goals, and I like to achieve goals, and I like to think of myself as capable, feeling off, like how did I do that? And confronting it by writing it down and letting it go was really one of the most transformational things for me. And she talks about it from step one, from chapter one. Because if you skip that part, you might trick yourself into thinking you can't lose weight. And you don't create what she calls this association between negative behaviors and negative consequences. If we never associate negative behaviors with negative consequences, and we associate negative behaviors with a lack of willpower or something being wrong with me, we're going to spiral and we're going to lack the ability to go two pounds at a time. I love to if anybody else, like for me, this was a big struggle. And she addresses it right here in chapter one, because you'll end the downward spirals. And it's really a huge part of what we're going to accomplish through going through this book together. Anybody have anything on this topic they'd like to share? I did want to say one thing that I also like that she reiterates both at some point later, actually in the book, but when she talks about two pounds and she does it online all the time, she says, at a time, there are many people who hear, she, they, they somehow hear what she's saying and they define it as two pounds a week which is not what she's saying. 
She's literally saying whatever that amount of time is to lose two pounds. The reason they think that is because she says it might even be this week. Right. Correct. <laughs> it might be. It might not. And no, but and she's and she's gone back to it in her own lives yeah. and whatever to say, I never said it should be two pounds a week. It might be, but it I'm never talking about a time frame. She's just talking about an amount of weight. Yes. Yes. And letting it accumulate. Uh, anybody else want to pause and have any thoughts or ideas on this idea about writing down the overeating episodes? Because I don't want to pretend here like this isn't big for everybody who <laughs> anybody who's not big for. So like if you've overcome this and this is no issue for you, we'd love to hear from you. And if this is an issue, this is our place to talk about it. This is book club. Can I ask a different question? Maybe sorry, because I had to run out in the very beginning before, like when you had first, first, first started. Is everybody, oh, and I'm really, good, I'm just asking this honestly, is everybody that's on the call tonight with the talking that we already started, that Michal started with last week, and we've been saying that we've been going to be reading the book. Has everybody recently in the last two weeks read chapter one? No. <laughs> Thank you for oh, your honesty, Mira. <laughs> Beautiful. Sabrina said she specifically over Parham made sure to commit to writing down every single bite so that she would be accountable. It, it's really about decreasing the shame and realizing that it's not a you problem. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> and whenever you see these um, influencers talk about how much they hate the scale and how the scale is evil, it all comes down to if you're looking at the scale as a judgment of who you are, or you're just looking at it as feedback and you're actually collecting the data. Because if you're not collecting the data, then why are you getting, you're getting on the scale to, to, to assess what? To assess your willpower level? To assess your motivation level? Those, those change hour to hour sometimes, <laughs> right? I but, also like in, I also yeah. like in this chapter that and she hits the nail on the head with we and, and as coaches we know because we've heard it all where she says you know people's skepticism uh, people are coming to two B because they've been skeptical they're skeptical because they've come from other things that didn't work and very often it's you want me to focus on two pounds at a time I have so many more than two pounds to lose and you want me to focus on two it it, it almost in their mind, it's the reverse. It's diminishing. No, I want to lose 80 or whatever the number is. I'm just throwing out a number. I want to lose 80. You want me to only focus on two? Like I have such a long road ahead. So they're almost like throwing the stumbling box at the beginning in front of themselves. Or I've done diets before and they've never worked. And she literally just delineates during this chapter, all the things that we say to ourselves to give us a reason why it's not going to work. Or, you know, this, the, where I, she said something, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but she said something about, um, oh, I have so much going on in my life right now. I'm on that you area. Are, You'll cut the BS. I've worked we, with we, several people tell me they want to lose weight, but their friends tell them they shouldn't. You don't have to. It's a busy career time. It's a second kid time. It's a financial stress time. It's a demanding relationship time. Why add dieting to your troubles? You're right. Let's not do that. But losing weight? That's only going to make everything else a little bit easier to deal with. I love how she, at the end of at the, the very last part of the whole BS thing, I highlighted in my book. I love that. So love your body enough to want to take care of it, work with yep. it and improve it, but don't settle. Keep focusing on the next two pounds at a time. And I love the part that she says, don't stop until you get the body you truly want, deserve, and will feel proud of like that. We really deserve it. Like everybody deserves to have what they want. And can have it. And not to stop. I mean, I can tell you, we've seen it in the group. A lot of people who have 80 pounds to lose, lose about 50. And people start with the comments sometimes. Or, you know, people get fit and they're like, I got it when I hit my goal number. Uh, I, I heard it from people who've been telling me to lose weight my whole life. They're like, you're looking a little thin now. Aren't you stopping? And it gets in your head a little bit. It gets in your head. Am I being obsessive? Because I don't know about you guys, but for somebody who was overweight for much of her life, I never enjoyed my body as much then as I do now. Is it healthy to like enjoy your body that much? 
Like, is that, is that healthy? Is that okay? I didn't know. I didn't have that as a, as an adult person, you know? And um, somebody wrote on Facebook today. Oh, how do you show you love yourself? You love your body outside of how you look as if it's not legitimate to actually love how you look. I think that's, I think that's a big one, a big, 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 big one. And we're supposed to say other things are more important. Now, yeah, there are other things, you know, in theory, but not, not to then level it and keep putting it down on, you know, on the bottom of the, you know, bottom of the list. Like it's really okay, especially when you're doing the right mindset work. Like we've, you know, like I say all the time, we all know thin, miserable people. That's not the goal that we're looking for. We're not just looking for the weight loss by itself. But Alana has said before, like when people start, when you talk about the comments of, oh, or you're so obsessed or are you done losing weight? Which I've gotten like, please tell me you're done just because it'll make their life easier to know that I'm done, you know? Um, she goes, but even in the form of you're obsessed with that, she's like, what else is more important in life to be obsessed with than your health? You know? That's what I've answered. That's what I've answered. So, and I love the Alanaism at the bottom. Self-discipline is the highest form of self-love. And I'm going to share just honestly that for me, losing weight in, emboldened me. Like, I love that word. It emboldened me to apply self-discipline to other areas of my life that really needed it. And it gives me the self-discipline to believe that I can be disciplined about money, about my relationship with God, about spirituality, in my marriage, in my parenting. Oh, I can do things. I can do things. I'm a self-disciplined person. Doesn't mean I'll make mistakes. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. But I understand that self-discipline is, like Alana says, a mix of my environment that I choose around me, positive people, positive weight loss. So if I have a new goal, I'm going to make sure I'm full of positive people. My environment, my kitchen, my whatever, my, my Shabbos table, how I, my, my pantry. So if I want to, you know, work on another area of my life, I'm going to make sure I have the tools. I'm going to make sure I'm, sur I'm like surrounding myself with the right systems and have a clear goal and not stop till I get there, no matter how long it takes, not putting that time frame on it. And it's just a lesson for how we want to go about all the other things in our lives. But you know what they say, you worry about everything else when you have your health. When you don't have your health, it's the only thing you worry about. Jen, no go joke. for it. No, it's just, I'm also really happy how she addresses the whole body positivity piece. Because it gets in our head. It does get in our head. And like you, I, I mean, I know one of my friends who is not on 2B and she follows one of these like, she shared with me this, there's this woman on Instagram who's very unhealthy weight and is a body positivity by so-and-so. It doesn't matter who she is. And it's just like, it's mind boggling to me. Like that's like, that's who you want to admire. And that's who you, it's not like being positive. doesn't mean not like, okay, you should feel good yourself at every weight, but that doesn't mean that you can't love yourself enough to be healthy. Like it's, I have to admit that it's not healthy. There, there's a big trend in the, I'll be, I'll be very vague. In the Jewish influencer world right now, there's a big tre trend of body positivity at a unhealthy weight. And I think Alana addresses it in the most beautiful way. And her wording is sensitive and, and the way that she presents it is sensitive. Um, but yeah, I, I, Jen, I've seen exactly what you're talking about, Jen. Yeah, and especially the from like I, it, it hurts me when I walk into show and I see so uh, I, I, uh, yeah to go on and on about kiddish and so what I love about that also and again a little earlier in the chapter she talks about it in the um in once she when she was sent to fat camp to weight loss camp and after she got past the what felt like you know rejection or judgment from her family which is actually really funny to me because at that time her parents were so enormously overweight also, you know, but again, but even if it's not necessarily from your immediate family, from society or what you think it should be, she then she then found friends and 
camaraderie and commonality. And I couldn't help but think how important that is. And thinking of our group, we can all come from different places and have different amounts of weight to lose or have different objectives. But it's so important being on this journey, feeling safe and feeling in a place that you're with other people who can relate, if not on this level, on that level. But even in the way that even if you have a family that supports you, still may not be on that same wavelength as you are right now. And that's really just a wonderful thing to, you know, that's why we keep on saying lean into this community. We are all so different from different places, different walks of life, different backgrounds, different stories of what got us here. But we're here because we all have the objective of doing this and getting healthy this way. You know, and like, you know, Jen said, like loving yourself enough to want to make the change, not just, you know, Alana says it all the time, this whole positivity and body image, but be, you can be, yes, love yourself. But if you're not loving yourself enough to make the change, then if you're going to do it just by a form of punishment, then you're going to lose the weight, but it's not going to be in a positive and way. And it's not going to stay off. It's mm -hmm. not going to stay off. We know now, um, I want to, I want to focus on the top eight tips for losing weight, which is how she ends the chapter. And that's what I'm going to focus on in the post this week. Um, because there were a few things that I thought were really, really key here that are really common that we're not doing, <laughs> but like sometimes like they're like some of the first things to go. And then the first things she mentions, but before that, I just want to say like, kind of my perspective on like looking around and show and everything. And, um, I'll just tell you my thought, like anybody can take this if it's helpful to them and, and leave it if it's not. But when I, I have many people who I love very deeply, who, who are overweight and people who are not and people who are very fit and healthy. And I do bike riding and I do stuff with them and, and other people who uh, I do other things with. And there are even some of my very heavy friends are really into basketball and they're really into lots of sports, sports I'm not even into. And they have a lot of healthy things going on. When I see somebody else who's struggling with their weight, I just really pray for them that they're going to have a moment that's going to inspire them that they also can change. In my opinion, most people who are drawn in by the toxic body positivity movement is that they don't believe that they have another option. They don't believe they can lose weight. They don't believe they will lose weight. They don't believe that it's possible for them. And so therefore, this is a very good option for that, is to at least really work on loving yourself and really work on eating nutritious food without ever looking at the scale. And you know, I have friends who are nutritionists and that's their thing, like scale is evil, just work on making healthy choices. I just know for me, that only got me to a certain point because I was still emotionally eating and I wasn't taking care of my environment. And if my environment wasn't conducive and I was still emotionally eating, it was like on a hamster wheel, I was healthy, overweight. And I was a holistic nutritionist, healthy, overweight for a long time until a few of the principles here. And so I don't look at them and think, Haval. I just really pray that they're going to have this moment and maybe I'll get to be that inspiration. They'll be like, you know what, if she can do it. Like I've had friends who be like, you know, when I got married at 19, I, I had friends who literally got married within six months of me, like got engaged because they're like, Lily can get married that quickly. Like, psh, can't be that hard. Like, I'm not, <laughs> people look at me and they're like, yeah, like if you can do it, then oh, probably I guess I could do it too. I've known you a long time. You're not that special. You know, I'm special, but you know what I mean? Like, that's how you want to look at your own journey. If you can do it, then you're just proving to your daughters, you're proving to your nieces, you're proving to your cousins who all know you've struggled. And if you can do it, they can do it. And it just, they should take that kernel of hope and maybe do something with it. So a few of the eight tips at the end of the chapter, page 20 and 21, okay, of the book, I think are really, really important. And a few that I think a lot of people skip, I'm just going to focus on, is the water immediately after the workout. Okay. A lot of people miss out on the opportunity to drink a lot of water. Anybody who struggles with water, who is doing a workout or walking, it is the easiest time to drink 16 ounces to a liter of water. Anybody who feels like when they work out, they're significantly hungrier throughout the day. 
increase your water around your workout time, really, really helpful. Again, like if you are also water before coffee, those are the two times she says to make sure you're drinking 16 ounces, like before you do, before you do anything else, before you get off the mat, 16 ounces of water. And the first thing when you wake up in the morning, 16 ounces of water. So many people like that leader is that, that leader that they really struggle with later in the day that you could have like that. The second thing is two cups of veggies by 2 p.m., right? A lot of people I know don't eat lunch till 2 p.m. And maybe they're at breakfast and then they're like halishing their something all at the morning, using, wasting all of their discipline and willpower to get to lunch when really planning to have two cups of veggies as a snack or sometime between breakfast and lunch or adding it to your breakfast or in some way really does change your palate it really does change what you crave. It really gives you so much more control and confidence whenever you sit down to a meal. So for you, you know, evening is really a hard time. That's your time to have like, hey, am I going to be another two cups of veggies by 8 p.m. when I hit like the witching hour? It's such a good like little, right? Two cups of veggies before you go into a meal or you go into an eating opportunity. I take this also before I go to restaurants on date night, I'm having an extra two cups of veggies before I show up there just to make sure that I'm, I'm in a good place. And two cups isn't overwhelming to the digestive system. It's not overwhelming to prepare. Two cups like isn't that big, right? For people who do 2B mindset. Um, another one is keep your hands, mouth, and eyes busy and distracted. If you are like thinking about food and going for food and like food, we all have been there. There's some food and it's calling to you. You know, in, in the Torah, it says like, you know, God gave us hard work so that we'd be distracted and busy and we wouldn't be sitting as much. It's normal <laughs> when we're, when we're busy, it's just so much easier. So like, it really is important on this journey to find a hobby, whether it's puzzles, whether it's knitting, whether it's coloring books, whether it's something to do with your hands while you're relaxing, tapping, breath work, hot bath, whatever. Those are three that I saw were really like just, and then of course the writing down after you have a binge or over <laughs> episode of overeating. Um, it's just, just really important, even in maintenance. Obviously there are times where I feel like I've overeaten and just writing it down helps me see if it was Maybe you had too much seltzer at the meal and that's what made me feel like I overate. Maybe I really overate. Maybe it was too hungry going into the meal. It just makes me more aware of maybe what happened that's different than usual. So those were kind of my three of the eight tips that I felt were really helpful. Let's just open it up and kind of what's going on with you guys. How, how are you liking the book club? Questions on book club? Something you want to share from the chapter or something that resonated with you that we spoke about this evening? Maybe somebody we haven't heard from yet. Seema, Randy, Alana, Debbie, anybody have a, anything to share? Or anything you want to apply it to? Yeah, anything you've had an experience with you can relate to. Guys, come on. You know, the three of me, you, you know, me, Lily, and Yoni can like talk, you know, like to no end about it. There's no way that you guys aren't thinking about something. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just, I want you to have an experience and, and a moment. And we have a moment when we're vulnerable and we share. So uh, anybody have anything? No pressure here. You don't want to share anything. You don't have to, but um, it'll only help you and help you feel connected to show up next week to find out what happens in chapter two. Because we don't know. It's a lot of good. Of right. the weight. Oh my God. <laughs> Or anything from the week before and how it, you know, anything that happened over the week of Purim. Or Go on or Pesa, questions. Or, okay. or post. I don't know if it's um, chapter one related because I haven't read it recently, but um, but I've been recording my binge. Um, I pushed really hard. I had two big Shabbatones that I was at two weeks in a row. I did amazing the first one. I had chose my treat carefully. Shabbos day. The second one, I went for my Shabbos day treat and it became a major cheat. And then it became a bigger cheat later that night and became a binge for the next two days. But I, I mean, I didn't do all the specifics, but I definitely documented binging. Um, and then I was so glad that I had that before Purim because then Purim, 
I just did it. I was, I was baking and I'm packing all the Mishloch Manod and all that stuff. And I just remembered delay not deny, like Yoni was saying um, to me just like an hour ago. Um, I mindfully enjoyed my Shabbos treat. And I waited till Wednesday after Purim for us. I saved something I was craving. I didn't touch a morsel, not a morsel. And I did not think that I could do that. And I enjoyed it mindfully the next day. And it felt really good. That's amazing. So first of all, a huge congratulations, because it's really hard, especially when it's spiraled over a few days. Can I ask just, did you track it as it happened? Or were you tracking it at the end or at the beginning, just for everybody to like, see what was really helpful? Uh, in terms of the binge, I'm not really sure. Um, some of it was after the fact, some of it was during, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Um, okay. But I do remember just feeling so disgusting. I feel, felt gross, felt um, exhausted, lethargic, and then just, you know, like depressed down because I, I couldn't accomplish anything. I just felt useless. And whenever I get to that, then I pull myself out of that because I just don't want to feel like that again. I have to figure out how to prevent that in the future. But when I can really stick to the, the treat days and hold myself back because I know I have that that I'm going to enjoy and not feel guilty about, when I can keep myself strong, that, that really helps. That helps me stay strong sometimes. I really love what you just said. Um, a few things that Alana said just on that topic, recalling which parts were probably not even worth it. I think that's kind of like how to prevent next time is really when you, when I, for me anyway, when I, like now, it's not that I never overeat, but I don't overeat on stuff that's not worth it anymore. <laughs> if it's not worth it, I will put it down and I will go find something that is worth it. If I'm going to do this, I better enjoy every bite because I've written it down enough, like, like pretzels, like pretzels better be in my special thing with my nuts, with my chocolate chips, with my craisins, like it better be the best pretzels ever, but I don't want to write down pretzels. And so I think that's a great point. Seeing that it wasn't as bad as you thought, right? Sometimes we've had like that extra piece of call and we almost want to spiral down and we're like, oh, okay. Like, what was I calling overeating? And then there's realizing right, like the call that wasn't that good. Doing. It was not so fresh. I'm like, I really don't want to waste it on that. Yes, exactly. And so then this one is huge. Realizing that you're probably due for a veggie and a lean protein as your next meal. And the overeating might have happened because you didn't have a protein and a veggie beforehand. And that's why having a protein smoothie, whether it's Shakeology or a different brand and veggies, two cups before I go to a restaurant is like clear to me. It just makes all the difference for me is knowing I'm going to have that lean protein and I'm going to have the veggies also Saturday night, even if I end up eating zucchini pizza, it's egg whites and veggies first thing, you know, because just having that light protein and the veggies puts me so much more in control to anything else I might want to eat to avoid overeating on those things. So I think that's an excellent, just you ask, like, how can I do it later? And then the last thing is the awareness of which foods aren't even really good to have around and keep those ones out of sight and out of mind because it makes the foods you ate less tempting because you've created uncomfortable and yet enlightening associations. If you have an uncomfortable association with having that brand of chips around, then it doesn't call to you the same way because it associated emotionally with like, ugh, ugh. So I think those are, are really important. And this is all just in chapter one. So I'm really excited that we get to unpack more and more wisdom each week, especially going into Pesach. And then we're going to go straight into the summer. Yoni, you have something to add? I wanted to say something because it's in this chapter and it's something that's come up very often in the group where she does discuss about weight loss mode melting mode. Yes. And maintenance. And I'm not, I'm not going to touch on maintenance yet because we touch on it again. But we've heard very often, like, I'm really, I'm doing all this stuff. And then when we dig deep, we're going, are you doing all this stuff? Are you kind of mostly doing all this stuff? And Alana really says in detail, to start being in weight loss mode, weight loss mode 
the last three to six weeks of you really doing all the this stuff. This is six to eight weeks. Six to eight weeks. Hold on. I'm reading. Sorry, I'm you're reading. right. Hold on. Yeah, so six weeks. Three to six weeks. You're right. It's three to it's six three to, weeks. It's three to six weeks and six to 20 weeks. Basically, yeah. I was going to say, because this, this is the part I've gone through with people only this, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. this week. Three to six weeks of doing all the stuff. And I'm not going to say, At the same are you time. drinking your water? Or... Correct. Meaning all, all the both days. bunnies. All, all the days. Four, <laughs> right. Every day you are doing all four things. Every day for three to six weeks you will be in weight loss mode. And for three to six weeks, if you are doing all the four things every single day, you will hit melting mode. But if you are not doing all of the things, all of the days of the week, you are still gonna sit in weight loss mode where it's up and down and up and down. And you are still not achieving that melting mode because of all the things. So when I say to some people at the top of your tracker, yes, it's good you're writing that you have water in one location and you have this in another location, your tracker. Put four circles at the top of your page. Am I water the right amount? At the end of the day, if you don't have a check mark, don't expect to still be hitting melt every single day for three to six weeks. If you have four check marks at the top of your page and you were veggies most, and you don't expect, don't have an expectation if you didn't do the work. And, and this is why anytime to someone it, says to me, give that checks and balances. I want to lose weight by this date, or I really want to see the next four pounds, the next eight pounds. I said, stop focusing on the scale. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? Are you willing to drink the water? Are you willing to be I would say emotionally uncomfortable for the next three to six weeks and use your tracker and reach out to your group and reach out to your accountability buddy if you have one and reach out to your coach if you're coaching. Every single time before when the desire arises, not just after you've done the action. And one of the things in, um, uh, Yalit mentioned at the very beginning was this um, emotion and like how we get in the mindset and making like getting emotionally like one of my favorite lines is motion creates emotion. Whatever you're doing ends up creating how you feel. So when you eat like trash, you end up feeling like trash. When you start to do the things and I lost all my 80 pounds, never hitting melting mode, just so you all know. I've hit melting mode many a time in maintenance, like to keep it down because I learned and I know what melting mode looks like now. But on my weight loss journey, I was five pounds a month, 80 pounds worth, five pounds a month. Okay. And so it, for me, I was not that consistent in maintenance. I have been way more consistent because I spent that long trying out basically everything to know what works for me and I don't regret it so if you're like you can't be that consistent for three to six weeks it's not it doesn't have to stop you but you also have to moderate your expectations exactly yeah Jen just though also the whole I can do this is like the one thing that's great about the tracker is it really reminds me that I can do this because like I'll be like really can I do it? Cause like I'm up, I'm up higher than where I want to be right now. And then I'm like, Jen, you have the proof. Like you, you got it. Like, so it, it, the tracker is so valuable to remind, like you did it before you have those, you can look back, you have exactly the, like your own record of exactly what works for you and to make it happen again. And I would say, this is the one thing I would love for everyone to walk away from like our intention at the end of this book, the end of all these weeks that we're going to go through together is that you stop resisting what works for you. The greatest gift of the to be mindset is you don't spend the rest of your journey resisting what is, makes you feel good in your body. Is you don't just go for that dream body, you go for the life that maintains the body. And, and I'll even like, I want if I, if I can add on to that, Lily, it's also Please. like what, what, what works for you and not looking around at like, but that, 
I see that person does this doesn't mean that that works for you. Like your everybody's different. And that's why I love this program. Cause I really like she said you, your tracker, like she gives you all these guidelines, but she, she'll say all the time, like even like all of it, she says they are guidelines. They're not, it's, you really, really have to figure out what works for you. And I love that. Like, it's just, and right. And not getting out and get out of your own way of what works for you. It's really true. Like, and, and that's own. what, you know, and that's where the, when, um, when Yoni said the four bunnies, not eating a carb at night is not one of those buddies. <laughs> okay. Plate it is not one of the bunnies guys, the veggies most in water first tracking in the scale. So when you're like, oh, but I'm having that carb at night, or I don't know if my portions are exactly right, you'll find out what your portions are through tracking. And plate it is just there to make, to cut that learning curve down by telling you what works for the majority of people. And everybody's really different. For me, Alana talks about all the time how she's really carb sensitive. She calls in her menopausal, you know, metabolism, and she can eat a lot of healthy fats. For me, it's the opposite. I can definitely eat a carb at night or eat more like an extra fruit. But it, the second I'm having too many healthy fats, my weight escalates and my cholesterol goes up even at a lower weight. So really it is very personal. And you, you really have to be open to finding out what works for you and then not spend your whole time wishing I could be eating more almond butter, but like enjoying the fact that I can put potato in my soup and it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, okay. Can I just say something to um, sure. kind of put, put together what you just said now and what Yoni had mentioned earlier about the four bunnies and are you really doing all four? I, I really want to re-emphasize like you had said and every time we say the word tracking so often when everyone's like I'm doing all the things because the water let's say at this point comes easier even though you might find I would still check yourself on that are you only just drink are you hitting your minimum or are you also water first not just water throughout the day and hitting your minimum you know, are you front loading it as opposed to just, oh my God, I didn't hit my water, then I drink it at night, so now I have something in my water. But the water in general, very often we're like, okay, I got it. The veggies most, again, you can double check yourself there. Are you veggies, like Yoni always says, are you veggies meh? Are you veggies some? Or are you veggies most? The scale, I think also a lot of people get into the habit of going on. But the tracking, if you want to know what might really be missing when you feel like I'm doing all the things, I, I find tracking sometimes is that one that says that you're kind of like, that's not necessarily making all the difference because I'm doing the water, I'm doing the veggies, I'm doing it. But the more you lean, Alana said this so often in the beginning of the program, like when she, you know, in the beginning videos and when she talked to the coaches and when she started her lives. When you focus on the tracker and not the scale, when you focus on the tracker, the scale will follow. So if you are doubting what we're saying about focus on the two bunnies, focus on those four principles for three to six weeks, all days of the week, you know, that then also means the tracking part for Shabbos. And if you're worried that you can't track Shabbos at the end of Shabbos, then that's something to look into about what is your job is. And I know I'm guilty of that also. And then it becomes a lot more, you know. That's um, where frustration lives. No, yeah. frustration lives in our unwillingness to look honestly at what is and accept and forgive and move on. Frustration is like the epitome of, I don't really want to look at what I'm doing. I'm only looking at what I'm getting and it's not good enough. If I look at what I'm getting or what I have and it's not good enough, then I'm frustrated. If I'm looking at what I'm doing, I'm either saying, hmm, I could raise the bar or, hey, I'm really proud of myself <laughs> or, wow, that was really hard. I'm going to forgive myself and move on. Look at what you're doing, not on what you're getting. I love that. That's great. Guys, put that on a post-it. <laughs> Okay, um, Alana, Mira, anybody? Finally, Sima, Randy, anybody have anything um, final questions, ideas, Sabrina? 
I know you were the baby, you texted before. Um, anybody here today, want to ask anybody else here, anybody here looking for a shit off for an accountability buddy? It's our last five minutes. Anybody here? I know Randy's looking for an accountability buddy. Anybody else here looking for an account a new accountability buddy? Hmm? I think it also, it's also helpful to know accountability for, meaning there are people right. who want a workout accountability buddy. Some people want a food tracker accountability buddy. So knowing what somebody wants it means that we can also talk to our other challengers if yes. Randy wants to come. Randy, tell us kind of something. what are you looking to be accountable with, with your buddy? It's hmm. a good question. I think I have to think about that. But um, I've been really bad at tracking. So it'd be great if someone could, you know, be my inspiration to keep tracking. Um, You're welcome really to check him if you want. Thanks. I may mm -hmm. take you up on that. <laughs> be ready for some accountability, but some tough love. <laughs> but I, I think I think that's um I think that's actually a really really great thing. I remember I don't remember Jen top on how long ago that was when all of a sudden she realized like oh that also might just be something that you know that's missing. And then even finding sometimes we get confused like within the book we feel like we need somebody at a similar stage as us or same age kids or even same city country this that you know whatever. But I think honing in on that saying you know what I'm having trouble consistently tracking or the level of tracking I'm at or the detailed level of tracking that I'm at. And that's something that I find that so many people can, you know, can relate to and taking that offline with somebody one-on-one -on -one and just at the end of the day, you know, sharing your tracker and knowing that you're doing that. Um, I think that that can work with you know, so many different, you know, people, uh, you know, in the group, even beyond like, oh, I don't know if this person or the other person will be able to give me the input. So much of it is just the fact that you're sharing it with another Showing person. Showing up. Yeah. And, and that no one's gonna, no accountability buddy's job is to chase you down. It's, I'll tell you, uh, Yellen and I are, are texting, we text each other, right? And it, anytime she writes what she ate, that's my call to action to do what I need to do. And I'm sure it's the same for her, right? She's not, I don't ever like be like, I yell at, where's your dinner? She's never like, Lily, what did you eat for breakfast? No, it's like, and this is what I ate. It was <laughs> that is the you invitation know. for the other person. With all these years, and Lily and I have been accountability partners on and off and some, you know, some months more and then for a long time not. And then Lily asked me recently, do we want to restart now working, you know, towards Pesach? And I knew I, I had a lot of trips recently and more, you know, and more are coming. And I just got back today. And it was the first time where I think I was then in touch with Lily on a daily basis while on vacation. And it, it makes a difference. Even when sometimes it didn't make a difference on a scale, I can say, believe me, that level of frustration when you know you are working so hard. I did not have a single French fry, <laughs> eight days. There was a freaking plate of French fries in front of my father's face. Cause that's what he asked for every night, which was then in front of my face. And I kept on repeating myself. I've had French fries before. I can have French fries again, you know, but, but whatever it is, again, I don't know if it's my medication. I don't know if it was altitude, whatever it was, but the scale did not go down. In fact, it creeped up by like 0.2 every single day, but I was so proud of what I was doing and the fact that I was tracking it all and sharing, I'm like, okay, whatever this is, I don't know, but I know I'm proud of myself and I know I'm doing what I, you know, what I need to be doing. And that makes a difference. It really makes a difference when Lily was talking about that level of frustration, when you can see back, reflected back in your face that you are doing and focusing on the tracking the scale will follow eventually it may not be today it may not be tomorrow it might you don't know what other adjustments necessarily are and that also doesn't mean everything's perfect i got through seven days and then mozay shabbos it wasn't the french fries but it was really late we were going to be awake all night and they did something really nice for me it was in italy and they just presented me with a vegan pizza <laughs> and i was like Give me all of it. I didn't touch a French fry, but then I ate my entire, oh, you know, and like Lily said, sometimes you're going to have to look back and say, you know, was that worth it? Or how did it make you feel? And I was able to tell Lily later on, 
I was able to move out on and forward past it because fresh bread happens to be one of those things that are worth it for you. Maybe not in that quantity. Okay. But it wasn't like she said, oh, I then just did it on pretzels or even, oh, I then did it on French fries. You know, so it's very interesting. There is no perfect, but when you are tracking it all and being accountable to somebody else, it's also you being accountable to yourself. And there's so much to be proud of just in that. A hundred percent. That's a perfect way to end. Uh, I can't wait to see you guys for chapter two. Read chapter two, listen to chapter two. I listen and read. And guys, don't tell me you don't have time. I listen to it on like the 35 minute drive from Talmon to Modine. Put the speed on 1.4 on your audible book and listen to the thing. Or easy okay? reading. It's easy reading. It and, is. and it's easy reading. <laughs> Okay. okay, but I read it's it not like and, and I had a very easy for meaning or like Homo sapiens, guys. This is like <laughs> it's cool. Okay, have a great week, and we'll see you guys next week. Please share all week. Um, in the post, we're going to go through the eight, Alana's top eight tips over the week. In the post, share how you're doing. Share if you're using them. What your best way to do that is. Have a great week.